So, uh, folks, my name is Gary Cranston. If you don't know me, I'm the president here at the American Writers Museum. Tonight, we're doing something a little bit different. Um, we're having our first book club meeting. Um, that was an idea that uh, has changed, as was mentioned earlier, as we uh, had to face our pandemic. Um, so. Uh, in the uh, spirit of a book club, we have a few people who are going to talk with our guest author tonight, Juan Martinez, um, who is also a professor of literature at uh, Northwestern University. Um, and I'm going to just take a couple of minutes to explain because Juan was a big part of helping us put together our special exhibit, uh, My America on Modern Immigrant and Refugee Writers. Uh, and for those of you who might not be familiar with it, I'm just going to... Um, try and share my screen, but I'm going to ask um, the AWM host who is hiding in the background to share my screen because apparently I have been disabled. Um, give me one second. Uh, for those of you who have not seen it, um, you can find it at www.my-america.org. Um, and it was a website that we've created because we have a in-person multimedia exhibit um, where we interviewed um, 31 different authors from around the country. Uh, and those authors uh, answered the same questions uh, in, we got different perspectives from different authors and we made that available for people to look at. Uh, when the pandemic hit, we took that content and those materials and especially the educational components to those materials and put them out online. Um, so we're looking forward to people um, you know, spending time at that site, and we're looking forward to being able to share that site with teachers um, around Chicago and around the country, because we know this fall, we will not be able to have the uh, normal range of field trips and student interaction that we normally have. So this is another way for us to um, share this information with schools and create virtual field trips that we're looking forward to helping to host um, throughout the rest of the year as we all deal with our new normal of not going out. Um, and uh, so that's pretty much what I wanted to mention to you. Um, I wasn't able to share my screen, so I'm not going to show it to you. I don't think we need to spend any more time on it. So um, we're here tonight partly because our Chicago Council, which is an organization of professionals of all kinds who support this museum, um, promote the museum, and really help us spread the word about the American Writers Museum. Uh, so they have asked tonight um, to make this part of uh, their organization and group and, and to kind of spread the word about what they do. So I'm going to ask Katie and, uh, and Olivia and Heather to come back um, and see if we can't um, start a conversation. Um, Katie was going to explain a little bit about what we do here um, and what the Chicago Council does. Hey, thank you, Carrie. Um, everyone, I want to just welcome you all. It's, it's, I don't see faces, but I know you're out there. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, this kind of came as an evolution between Olivia and Heather and I coming up with um, a book club, which while we would love to have had it in person, um, what we thought would be fun uh, in lieu of that is getting together on Zoom. And um, Hopefully we will enjoy it as much as we hope you will. Um, the three of us are members of the Chicago Council and the Chicago Council is part of the American Writers Museum. And really we are a group of corporate professionals and civic leaders. And we're engaged and invested in the mission and pro programs of the American Writers Museum. So we um, have made it uh, a mission of ours to bring writers to people in Chicago and across the country and um, really expose um, uh, what's so fun about um, uh, any kind of books that people are reading and really being able to give a platform for people to, to speak about them, um, look into, um, uh, investigate, uh, and, and really enjoy uh, local um, writers. And, and we're lucky today to have Juan Martinez, and I'm, I'm hopeful that everyone has read the book um, and has a lot of questions for him. Um, just so uh, in case people are interested, we, we do other fundraising events. Um, we hope to do this again. We hope to, um, based upon everyone's interest and participation, um, we will absolutely let people know if we decide and when we would have another book club, but we welcome suggestions. Um, just uh, want to make this an interactive, interesting, fun hour for you all. So 
please do not be shy. Um, ask your questions. We hope you find this as informative as we want it to be for you. So thank you, Carrie. I yeah. muted myself so as not to make background noise. Um, I'm just holding up the book so everybody can see the copy of The Best Worst American by Juan Martinez. Um, as I mentioned, Juan is a professor at Northwestern and a main uh, voice in our special exhibit. And um, we're really thrilled that he can be here tonight. Juan, do you want to introduce yourself and say hello? Absolutely. I just want to thank everybody uh, for being here. It is so cool to be able to just talk with people. I'm so good to see everybody's faces. I'm kind of bummed that I can't see the attendees, the, the participants, <laughs> but I just want to say that I'm waving at everybody and saying hi. It's just very exciting to be here. I just wanted to go ahead and do say two very, very quick things, uh, particularly because today is the funeral of George Floyd. Uh, and as a Colombian, uh, there is, I think, uh, both systematic oppression and systematic racism uh, in Colombia as well of uh, the Afro-Colombian community. It's, I think, a problem that is spread above and beyond the US. Uh, and I just wanted to both acknowledge that and speak to that. And also just because the funeral of George Floyd happened in Houston, and if anybody is looking for, if anybody found themselves enjoying short stories and realizing, oh my God, I can actually read a short story in 10 minutes or 15 minutes and it's something I can do and it makes me feel better about the world in one way or another. Uh, Brian Washington's Lot, uh, L-O-T, is this amazing short story collection that's getting all kinds of prizes. And it is a love letter to Houston. You know, it's a messy love letter, but it's awesome. And it's, uh, it has these uh, sort of just beautiful, magical stories of, you know, the entire gamut of what it is to be a human being in Houston and in America. I just wanted to throw out a book that I love out there for anything else, but I'm just so happy also because it's weird when you're just talking about your own book, I just wanted to make sure that I threw some love at another book as well. Uh, but I'm so happy to be with you all. Thank you, Juan. Um, can you, can you kind of start us off by just talking about this collection and this book and what drove you to put these stories together and, and you know, how did that come about? Absolutely. So uh, the story sort of got generated over a period of, I want to say almost 15 years, which kind of blows my mind because you don't realize how they are they starting. Uh, I uh, would do these uh, when I was supposed to be working on a novel. Uh, and then when I was getting my PhD in, in literature, uh, I, was, I did, did these so I would be, uh, they, they wouldn't have to work on my dissertation. So there were just ways to procrastinate on, uh, you know, the real work that I was supposed to be doing at the time. Uh, and they've been slowly collecting over that period of time. Uh, but they were really all about the very strange experience of what it's like to be uh, both in love with the US and also not quite figuring out what your place in the US is. Where, where do you live now? Are you here in Chicago? Yes, we live in Chicago. Okay. We're actually um, uh, partly because uh, my mother-in-law uh, lives in Kentucky. And mm -hmm. during the pandemic, we've been able to, we're in Kentucky right now, just so, so they can actually mm -hmm. help out a little bit, you know, bring groceries, see how she's doing. Um, and so we've been sheltering in place in Kentucky now for the last couple of I got it, almost like two months now. Okay, and where did you grow up then? I grew up in Colombia. So I grew okay. up in, uh, uh, well, actually, so I was born in, in Colombia and then almost immediately after I was, uh, my, my dad got a job in Venezuela. Uh, this was during the oil boom uh, back in the, you know, late seventies. And so we, uh, we were in, in Venezuela for a bunch of years. He worked on this hydroelectrical dam. So it was actually in a workers camp for about seven years, mm -hmm. which was, I always say workers camp, uh, but it had two bowling alleys. It was really fancy. Uh, 
And it was this incredible place where uh, there were Americans there, there were Canadians, there were, uh, there's a Japanese company that I think was in charge of the engine, the turbines. So there's a bunch of different, there's all these sort of people who are just in the jungles of Venezuela. And uh, yeah, so that's where, those were my formative years. So it's like my first eight years. And then after that, it was a lot of mm -hmm. Colombia and a little bit of the US. So certainly from your short stories, I feel like I could tell you're from Colombia. Yes. But I also thought you were going to be a short, fat, bearded, socially <laughs> awkward man who loves cats. Yes. Any of that true? Like, how do you relate to this voice that I feel like is prevalent in a lot of your short stories? Well, all of that is true. I, I mean, we have a cat. We used to have two. Uh, so I, I do love cats. Uh, and I was, I was a fairly... Um, fairly fat person, I was, I was heavy, uh, you know, for, for a long time. Um, and, and so all those are little bits of me. I mean, they would have been little bits of me anyway. Um, I don't know, Zadie Smith has a really great line on how uh, basically every character that you put in your fiction is a little bit of you. And so you kind of grow, you know, grow to love all of them. Um, and so, yeah, the uh, Machulin, who is the, the, the fat bearded uh, yes. cape, he's got, I never wore a cape, I should probably, okay. so for people who, there's, yeah, there's I actually a, like cape. I, I, I mean, hey, if you can pull it off, you know, that's, you know, and I think Machulin definitely could pull it off, you know, he's got like that, uh, I mean, Orson Welles, you know, is notorious for wearing capes, and uh, the Canadian author, uh, Robertson Davis, who I, I adore is um, also wore capes. Uh, so there's a part, yeah, there's like the part of me like wishes I could wear a cape. So <laughs> that's the other, I think that there's, there's also like an, uh, for people who are into fiction or any kind of art, I think you know this already, but there's, there is kind of a Barbie dream house aspect to uh, uh, fiction where you get to do things uh, in, stories that may, maybe you wouldn't have the, the boldness or the, you know, lack of judgment to engage in otherwise. So it's, that's part of the fun of fiction. Yeah. So Juan, which, which of the stories, um, because I think all of them had to kind of, they all touched on really difficult subjects and, and made us all uncomfortable. I think yes. there was a lot of aspects of your stories that made us uncomfortable, which I think was your point. Yes, and it may it kind of took you out, and you you didn't really know what to do with it. I think much of what you talked about um, being the fact of people trying to fit in and not really quite sure where they fit in. What was your most difficult story to write? All these stories. Oh, that's a really good question. The I'm going to answer it with you know in a slightly bent way. I'm going to tell you like what I feel is the most disturbing story in, in it, uh, which is involves, and I guess like for people who read it, it's a, uh, a story where at the end there's just a bunch of, it's, it's a very disturbing imagery with a bunch of like, like little demon babies that have sort of been tucked away in a bunch of subdivisions in Las Vegas you know, by this really monstrous narrator. Uh, and it's a really, it's such an uncomfortable story. That was the easiest story to write. I had like a really fun time writing it. Why? That, tell us why that was so easy. <laughs> well, I, I think that there's a, uh, there's a part of me that loves literary fiction. There's a part of me that loves all kinds of like, you know, I, I'm, I, I, like many other people, I'm a huge fan of writers like Chekhov uh, and Catherine Ann Porter, uh, you know, these writers who do these incredibly beautifully, tonally balanced, beautifully shaped uh, pieces that just, uh, but I also love trashy horror uh, fiction and also trashy horror movies. And there's a lot of stuff that you can say in those genres that I think is just fun. Um, and, but also like it gives you license to, I think, step over the boundaries of good taste. Um, I think this line is often attributed to Picasso that uh, 
good taste is the enemy of great art. Uh, so it's, uh, I think genre, when you play with genre, right, especially for me with horror, uh, it's an opportunity to sidestep some of the considerations that I think very carefully crafted fiction uh, asks you to do. So that's, uh, I don't know, I, I, I imagine that some of the people uh, in this, maybe I know you're all uh, professionals and have awesome jobs, but I don't know if any of you are interested in writing, uh, but one of the things that I always sort of tell people who are into writing, I mean, if you love to read, you may be into writing. And what I always tell them is that if you do, it's always a good idea to connect with the stuff that you loved when you were like 12 or 14, uh, because the stuff that you respond to when you were that young, it might be stuff that you want to return to as a writer. Yeah. We do have some authors on here right now. I don't know awesome. if they're going to pipe up later in the Q and the chat. But yeah, we do. We really do. And we have the founder of the museum, Malcolm O'Hagan, oh, wow. um, who's on this call right now, all the way from Washington, D.C., which is, you know, one blessing, I guess, out of this whole mess that we're in, um, not being able to be in person. We are able to bring in people from all over tonight. And That's hi, cool. sister in uh, Maryland. She should be on as well. <laughs> hi, everybody. Yeah, so that, I just realized that was such a long answer and such like the wrong answer to a really good question. Well, I, I don't think it's the wrong answer. I think it's part of the process because yeah. I think the, the process, and so I guess that kind of comes into a, a question that we had thought about was how do you how do you go about finding your characters and identifying them? It sounds like you you identified people who are obviously not able to kind of fit in. I saw there was a lot of Vegas, you know, there's a lot of, mm -hmm. um, yeah. are you identifying people, are you identifying communities where you've seen more of the disfranchised individuals living? Are you, um, how are you going about it? And are you doing research with this? And, and is it based upon kind of a mixture of personal experience research, that sort of thing? I mean, a lot of it is personal experience and a lot of it is, I, um, so I lived in Vegas for a long time. I was, I was there getting my PhD. So I lived there for seven years, six years. And uh, because I was an international student uh, and somebody who wasn't really, I didn't, uh, and who had always been sort of, had arrived in the US without really, with a student visa. So it wasn't like I was, uh, um, I couldn't really work outside of the university. I could never really afford a car. Uh, for a long time. And so one of the most formative and important experiences in my life is in like for the many, many years that I was in school in the U.S. is that I always took the bus, which I know I just realized we're talking to Chicago, right? So Chicago, we take the L, we take the Metro, we take, well, we don't right now, right? But uh, <laughs> um, so the, uh, a lot of my experience came from this sort of very intense divide that happens between people in car-oriented metropolitan areas like Las Vegas and like Orlando, where if you have a car, you're one type of citizen. And if you don't have a car uh, and you have to take the bus or walk, uh, then you're very, you know, your experience of the city is very different. So that's when one place where I found the people that I wrote about. Uh, but the other part of it is um, a lot of them, a lot of the people in there are, they're not me, but they're uh, people who share a significant slice of experience that I've sort of led them. Yeah. Definitely um, snippets of you, because I definitely got the bus part and the cat and the Las Vegas, all, all of that. Did bit. you, did you take your cat on the bus? No, I never did. Okay. okay. I That's never, funny. never did. Uh, but I will say that the, in that story, uh, I think I actually named the cat and the cat is named a uh, Hodge. Uh, and there's a, uh, that, that is the name of, what's the name of the cat that we had at the time. So he's a real cat. He's very sweet. And we never did the leash on him. I was about to say, was he yeah, on a leash? It would have been a disaster, but but again, like Barbie Dreamhouse, right? I can I can totally take my cat on a 
think so one of the things that I always find interesting about stories, um, and I'm sure other people can relate, is that you have to kind of, when you look at stories, it takes you a while to get into them. You can't quite figure out where it's going. Yeah. Um, when you're going through the writing process, do you have a an end in mind and then you build back and try to kind of fill in as your, because I think many of us, when we, when we read stories, we're like, wait, we, we, the, the pieces aren't connected yet. And we're just trying to figure out at some point it comes together. And I'm always curious in the mind of a, read, a writer, are you starting at the end and then you're kind of going in to get there? Because, you know, often as a writer, or as a reader, you're, you're really trying to figure out, do I have to reread this because I've missed some key points at the beginning? And it's just, I'm always curious to know what a writer is thinking about. Are they planning at the end or are they, are they doing it as a, as a, I'm, and I'm imagining it's probably different from, for every writer, but I guess for you specifically, what, what would that be process be like? That's a good question. I would say that it's not just from writer to writer, but it's from story to story. I think some stories, you know what the end that the end that you're aiming for is, and uh, that's a blessing and a curse uh, because if you are over determining it, you sort of start struggling a little bit with what it is that you're uh, you're doing. Um, for a lot of the stories, and I know I'm not the only one uh, for whom this happens. You're not really starting with um, an ending or a situation. Sometimes you're just starting with an image. Right, and you're building, uh, and usually it's an image that you can't get rid of uh, for whatever reason, like an image that just doesn't make sense. Um, and you sort of work your way from that image to a situation and to people and to scenes. Um, and the way that I talk to my students about this in class, uh, and it's something that I stole from uh, the writer, Jeff Vandermeer, who if people know is from, he did uh, the Area X novels, uh, it was turned into like a Natalie Portman movie with annihilation. He has a really great insight into this, which is that the order in which the writer discovers the information about a story is not the order in which the reader needs to find it out, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, uh, there's a lot of work uh, that happens between that first draft of a story where the writer is figuring stuff out and the final draft of a story where you're rearranging the information so that uh, it is, it makes some sort of emotional or logical sense for the reader, right? To be taken from a particular beginning to a particular end. Yeah. Heather and I talked about this, we were texting late at night when we were reading the book. Some of them seem like streams of consciousness. Is yeah. that true or, okay. We didn't know if that was just our late Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is, uh, a lot of it is sort of like riffing on images right? And then the images sort of start piling up on each other, right? And, and they get to a place, right? And a lot of them are, you know, it's, it's a, you know, it's usually a fairly lonely voice of a narrator trying to connect with the world and trying to figure out a way to connect with the world. Uh, so, so yeah, no, that's a, so was that just for Best Worst American or is all of your writing like that? Do you have different styles? Do you do a longer novels as well? I know um, you mentioned horror genre, but I didn't know if those were also short or long. No, so I'm, uh, a lot of it is, uh, some of it is similar. Some of the techniques uh, go from one, one project to the next. And uh, some of them are not like the two, um, I'm working on two novels right now and in both of them, I would say the presentation is a little bit more straightforward. Uh, part of it is, you know, like when you're asking somebody to invest in 300 or 600 pages of time with, uh, with some people, uh, I don't want a lot of, uh, I, I don't want a lot of the stuff that, uh, I, you know, you, it's, a, it's a big time commitment and you don't want people to get lost, right? I don't mind somebody getting a little lost and a little bit like navigating through the thicket of like somebody's consciousness uh, because you know you'll be out of it. Or, you know, you, you, you know, when you read a short story, you know, oh, I'm going to be out of here in like a page or five pages. So 
it's, it can be very dense, but it can be very, um, very short. Um, but yeah, it's, I, yeah, I found that. I found, I, I thought it was an interesting comment that you made in the beginning, because especially, I, I feel like people's attention spans are, you know, especially, I mean, you know, Olivia, Heather, and I had enough hard, hard enough time organizing this whole thing in terms right. of getting together that, it's, you know, especially being um, busy professionals, I have a hard time sitting down with a book. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have told people every year, my New Year's resolution, I never do it. My New Year's resolution is to read a book a month. And then I start out with that New Year's resolution and I never get it done. And I find short stories so much easier to internalize. And I don't know if that's a matter of uh, my attention span. I have young kids. I, I think the end of the day is I don't have a lot of time for myself. Um, what I really enjoyed was the, it doesn't feel as daunting because you can really, like you said, kind of absorb these kind of, and, and you don't feel like you have to go at it for a long, long time to try and get into, which can be mentally exhausting, especially when you, um, when you go there. So do you, do you prefer the short story genre? Do you, do you prefer that, that way? Or do you think, does, does it feel somewhat limited because you can't expand over pages and pages about certain characters? Because I imagine your characters seem very complex. They're, they're, you know, in, in reading some of them, you're just like, where do these people come from? And so, you know, I imagine it can be both overwhelming, but also gratifying to have a very extensive investigation to people. So would you take any of these short stories at any point and, and kind of make a bigger novel out of it? Is that something that you ever thought about? Because, or, or are you considering the reader too? Because these are very intense type of, of individuals that you're writing about, reading about, and I think I just talked about the fact that a lot of our attention spans are limited <laughs> in terms of the ability to process. So, yeah, I think for me, uh, what I've learned probably the hard way is that uh, as much as I love characters, and as much as I love to follow a character around, a, uh, and again, this is not every writer, this is just, it just depends on the writer. Um, I actually need a much clearer set of uh, stakes when it comes to a novel and a much uh, more defined plot arc. Like I, and, and like, it's just one of those things where I just gotta be honest with myself. And like, when I read a novel, I'm not look, I, I mean, I love, I want characters to follow and I wanna believe in them, but I also wanna know what's gonna happen next a lot of times. And so um, I feel I know that there's writers who are capable of perfectly balancing, you know, these sort of complex characters and fun kind of plots that unfold. Uh, for my part, I need, uh, I kind of have to dial back, you know, character density and sort of just go for funny or fun kind of stuff happening on the page. So that's the, that's the thing. And I'm also like working on a, but I am also working on shorts. I mean, I, but I love both forms. I'm working on um, a series of short stories that are all set in Chicago right now. And oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah, and they're, they're fantastic. Actually, one just came out in Shenandoah, just this amazing web journal uh, out of Washington and Lee University. And it's about Andersonville. And it's like yeah. this really messy love letter uh, to Andersonville. Uh, yeah. Um, one, I have, a, I have a question based on some of what you were talking about, but I was yeah. also wanted to remind our, our viewers um, who are in the audience um, that if they want to ask a question, they can type it into the Q&A function at the bottom. So look at the bottom of your screen, click Q&A, and go ahead and, and post some questions, and we'll get to those in a little bit. Um, as you were talking about the idea of the short story versus the novel, uh, one of the questions that I had was sort of this notion of what, um, when it comes to assembling a book of short stories, what thought did you put into the notion of order of those stories? You know, what, what drives that, that kind of process? It's a really good question. And sequencing in short stories is, there's a bunch, you'll get a bunch of advice, especially if you've ever been 
taken a creative writing class or got, got an MFA or anything, there's a couple of like rules of thumb that people do. Like uh, one of which is that you kind of want to grabby, kind of like a loud story first, just to catch people's attention. And what I've heard uh, is you always kind of go for like a very strong story at the beginning, strong story to end, something in the middle that's kind of like wakes people up. Uh, so that's sort of the... Stop, they're <laughs> all strong. They're all strong. Thank you, Olivia. <laughs> <laughs> I, that is very, that's so kind. Thank you. Uh, I, just to be 100% real with you all, uh, the, I don't know of any writer who's actually ever felt that way about their own work, that they're, you know, especially when you're writing short stories that they're all strong. And I, I have a bunch of graduate students that I sort of shepherd through, you know, their collections, uh, especially when they're do doing short story collections. And they're always sort of freaking out about like this one story that's not good enough. And I always, my sort of like, my two go-to stories actually come from music. Uh, and I tell them like, listen, like the Beatles, every time they would assemble an album, they, they always thought of like, we have two singles and those are the good songs. And then we have the filler mm -hmm. and that's the rest of the album. So if you think you have one bad story, you know, like John and Paul were like, you know. Just just put it in the middle. Is that yeah, they saying? just put it in the middle and it, you know, you know, it's Eleanor Rigby or whatever, right? So yeah, and then like, we sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I was going to say, we have a couple questions. Do you mind if I... Oh my God, I, no, I would love to answer questions. Yeah, I, I just figured I want to make sure people feel that their questions are being answered. Yes. So I'm sorry if I sound like a robot, but I'm going to read them. Um, one uh, question is, I'm particularly taken with the stories in this collection that are vignettes. And I'm especially intrigued by strangers on vacation, snapshots. I don't think I've ever felt too compelled to do a close reading of a short story before all of which is to say, could you talk about the inspiration for that story and what you see as the symbolism of the weevil? Cool, okay. Uh, first of all, hi Clayton, Sissy, that's the, the question. And that's a really fantastic question. I, so I think that what I can say is that sometimes these, especially the very, very short stories are uh, begin to be sort of like examinations of like a very small thing that you find and that you never know exactly how to feel about it. And in that one was like, what happens when you see somebody like you completely don't know and it's their vacation photos and you start flipping, through, you know, like for whatever reason, like you're, you know, like you're visiting a house and there's like a stack of photos and you kind of go, oh, they were in Bermuda. That's nice, right? Or like, oh, and now they're in, like, okay, they're in Pittsburgh, okay, right? And so there's this, uh, that's sort of like the very weird feeling that people get when uh, you start building a story out of other people's memories. Um, so that's, that's, part, that's definitely where something, where that, a part of that story uh, came out. And I think my, the, the idea of the weevil is, um, at first, like the anytime anybody says symbolism and says, could you explain why this is here? I think writers want to get very kind of flippant about it and say, oh, I don't know. I just thought a weevil was funny, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, I can tell you right now that I knew when I was playing with this story, I think I had a couple of other animals. And of course, Disney World, there's like all sort of things. There's the fact that it's kind of funny to be... Uh, like in a, like you start thinking, what are some inappropriate theme park theme park, you know, costumes that we could throw in there? Uh, but because the weevil can be like an invasive species, and the story, and you know, he starts showing up in other things, uh, it felt like a, a nice sort of way of reinforcing the idea that there was something invasive about characters showing up again and again in different places, but also maybe a little bit in uh, the, the invasiveness of a narrator grafting a story onto, uh, onto somebody else. So uh, if you're a writer, Clayton, I don't know if you are or not, that's a, a trick that I think works really well for people is 
uh, when you have an idea or an image or anything, if you just keep putting it in over and over and over again, it starts making its own meaning uh, just by the way it rubs up against other things. I hope that was, that was helpful. <laughs> so our next question is from a good friend of mine who's also an author. She published her first book recently, Angela Terry on San Francisco. She asked, were there any authors that inspired you to become a writer? And if so, what was it about their writing or story that inspired you? Angela, that's a really cool question. And I want to keep it super short because I also want to ask you, like, I want to hear about your book. So please tell me about it <laughs> as well. Uh, but as for that question, I, uh, there's many writers. Uh, as a Colombian, uh, you can't really get under the shadow of Gabriel Garcia Marquez. So he was a, a big one. Love, love Garcia Marquez. Uh, uh, for me, uh, Vladimir Nabokov, uh, the Russian-American writer who wrote uh, Lolita and Penin and Pale Fire and a bunch of other amazing, amazing short stories as well. He was a huge inspiration. I just loved how he wrote. I loved how he could wind his way around the sentence uh, in some really ways. I like the boldness of his, the way he could just make a story just fracture your mind in some ways. Uh, but also the fact that he was a non-native English speaker who had sort of involved himself deeply with uh, what you could do with the English language and you know how could you could take it. Yeah, so that was the, the person. You know how uh, your spouse yeah. interviews you when you're dating? My husband made me uh, read Love in the Time of Cholera when we were dating. And if I didn't like it, I don't think he would have married me. Oh, man. <laughs> That's hey, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> Heather, do you have any um, guests on the Q&A who have asked some questions? Uh, we just said Clayton, who, by the way, said that he could talk to you for two hours about that story. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Angela asks, how old were you when you first started writing, and did you know you always wanted to write? I started young, uh, but I never, and when I say young, I guess I, I love to read. I was a voracious reader. I read like from, I know, I mean, I have memories of reading when I was six or seven. I, uh, but I didn't really know that I wanted to be a writer. I loved comic books and I loved movies. And I really thought that I was going to be a movie director. I think I wanted to be, I really wanted to be a movie director for a long time. Um, so I didn't quite figure out that writing was the thing that I wanted to do or that I even that I felt that I was good at it until I took a creative writing class when I was a college student in Orlando. And I had my professor, Susan Hubbard, said to me, hey, you know, you're good, really good at this. And uh, that was the first time anybody had said that to me. So that felt that felt really good. Yeah, awesome. so that's when I, I kind of knew. But I, I admire people who are like, oh, I knew I was like, you know, I, I was two, I wrote my first novel, it was five pages, so it was about mummies. That wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why people like you, you're honest. Yeah. Right. Um, I can ask the next one, uh, Cheryl Ziegler. Hi, Cheryl. Says, Apologies for straying from the book, but you are a wonderful artist. Love your post-it drawings. Any plans for combining your drawings with your short stories? It'll happen, I think, eventually. I, there's a, so I'm, I'm finishing up, when I say finishing up, like I'm halfway through a book of short stories on Chicago that I'm hoping to finish by the end of next, by the end of, by the middle of next year, you know, knock on wood. Uh, and uh, I, I really want to, I really want to do something that mixes uh, art, I like Mrs. Drawings and a narrative. I still don't know how I'm going to do it. Uh, I am still kind of figuring out what, you know, what are some things that can work with that in some ways. Uh, but it's definitely, the posted drawings are definitely kind of training. And, and for, I guess I just realized people who do, uh, on my, on Twitter and on Instagram, I will doodle uh, some stuff and will post a very, kind of like this very, a posted, you know, it's always drawn on posted, and then it has a very long kind of ridiculous uh, description of what it is 
Uh, for a long time, it was always like the Willis Tower with googly eyes, uh, doing stuff that you wouldn't think that the Willis Tower would do, like <laughs> you know, go night swimming in Lake Michigan. Okay, so the next question is either submitted by Esther Chang, which is what it shows, or Laura Schwartz, who just texted me the exact same question. So um, both lovely, lovely lady, ladies here in Chicago. Um, Esther is an attorney at Mayor Brown, and Laura is an author and a great friend of ours and a huge supporter of the museum. She's oh, emceed yeah. several events for the Chicago Council. We, you know, our first event was this crazy costume party, the Great Gatsby. Oh, nice. um, theme party. It was so much fun. And then we did a vampire theme last October. So thank you to all the Chicago Council um, supporters out there. So the question is my reflection. Thank you for sharing your approach regarding your first draft versus the draft the reader sees. I feel like that relates to life now as we know it among George Floyd and what draft we are in. How Black Lives, wait, sorry, what draft we are on in how Black Lives Matter and in this unfortunate journey of COVID. My question, do you have a space, either physically or emotionally, that you go to to write? Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, that is such a good question. Uh, and I, I like how we're tying it to this idea of what, where we're at right now uh, in history, right? Because we're, we're in a really terrible, messy draft, right? We don't know what's going to happen. And, you know, we hope, I think, that things are going to be better good uh, so I think that there's a there's a very real sense that what we do in our writing can mirror uh, the processes that we experience in life right and the idea that we can try at least to be aim for improvement try to uh, do better um, so so yeah it's a uh, absolutely that I just want to make sure I just wanted to acknowledge the truth of what you just said I think that's a it's a very real thing, right? Uh, that all drafts exist in potentiality, right? In the idea. And just to keep that uh, analogy going, one thing that I always tell my students and I always sort of have learned the hard way is that, uh, you know, there is no such thing as writer's block. Uh, there's only the fact that, oh man, just sorry, just, I don't know if you can hear my five-year-old is, Oh, it's crying right Thank now. you. <laughs> it's okay. We're all in the same boat. Yeah. He can come uh, say hi. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, okay, good. He's okay. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the other, the other side of that, I think is that, right? Like when you're writing a story, uh, the, you know, you begin, I think people begin with a lot of great intentions, a lot of good intentions, uh, people who've, written, you know this, uh, people just starting out writing, you know this, and it's really easy to begin a story or begin a project or begin any endeavor. It's really hard to finish it. And one of the things that you need is sort of to trust the process and realize that if you keep working on it, it'll eventually get finished and you'll eventually make it better. Um, and so that's what I would say is a, my emotional state when I write, the, the, the emotional space that I write in is this uh, space of trust in the fact that whatever I'm doing for the present day, if I'm with it, it will eventually be uh, be better, uh, and it will eventually get done. Like you know, I just need to you know even and it's hard right now, of course. Uh, I think we're in a, a moment where a lot of our attention necessarily has to be toward what's going on in the streets and what's going on uh, politically. And that is absolutely cool. But as writers, one of our jobs is just to take notes, right? Just to keep going. And just to finish this very, very quickly, physically, the space that works best for me in writing has, has less to do with a room and more with the fact that I'm writing everything by hand these days. I do everything. Every first draft is uh, I do by hand. It just makes my writing better because I, I'm among other things because I can't go on Twitter or you know look at the Washington Post news alert and see what what fresh ore has landed. It kind of in line with that. Peg Duncan wants to know how much time do you spend each day on your writing? Uh, these last couple of weeks have been really hard, 
so I have not been writing. Uh, the part of it is the, the fact that I am preparing a course and because of COVID, uh, the course is online. And so a lot of energy and effort has to go to making sure that the course is solid online, but that takes a lot of you know, forward work. Yeah. Normally though, uh, and this varies for a lot of people, but if I can put in half hour to an hour a day, I'm happy. And it, it usually leads to a, enough material. Yeah. Heather, do you want to hit up David's question? Yeah, I've got, uh, and this is actually my friend, Josh Carter, who used to be at the Goodman Theater in Chicago. Oh, cool. Down Atlanta. Josh wants to know, has writing stories that touch on identity or belonging influenced your own sense of belonging? That's a really good question. They actually, um, yeah. So like one of the ways in which it, so, uh, I wish I could remember who said this first, but one of the things that I love about literature is that I think, I used to think I'm this weirdo who keeps having these imaginary conversations with people, real people in my head at all times, right? Like I'm talking to you all right now I'm saying stuff and then I'm sure in like 10 minutes when I say goodbye to you all and I go to other things later tonight, I'm gonna say, oh my God, why didn't I say this perfectly beautifully tuned thing to Heather? I should have said this to Heather. And then tomorrow, Heather, I may wake up thinking of the thing, still having this conversation with you, right? In my head. Uh, and, and somebody said that like the beauty of uh, literature, right, is that uh, you get to see everybody's imaginary conversations broken open and you realize, oh, I'm not this one weirdo who has this imaginary conversations. Everybody's a weirdo. Everybody has these mm -hmm. conversations. Everybody's trying to connect, right? Everybody's trying to make sense of the world and sort of being able to inhabit somebody else's consciousness and seeing how that happens helps you sort of negotiate your way around the world. So that's the reading part of it, but definitely writing has helped me figure out stuff about myself, not to be all, not to get too therapeutic about it, but it's definitely uh, has helped me understand uh, the ways in which I feel I belong and the ways in which I know I don't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it looks like your neighbors have chimed in. Oh my God, Lisa, Charles. Lisa, Chuck, and Daphne. Yes, I know them all. They, all they, of them have, are cats. they have a question for you. Ah. Um, their question is, how do you know when a short, short, a short story is complete? Or the collection, I'm sorry, the collection oh, the of collection short stories. Is, is, yeah, how, how do you know when you've, you've done enough, essentially? That's a really good question. I, uh, for people who are putting collections together, uh, it's always a, a difficult navigating. It's, it's difficult to navigate it because on the one hand, you want to put everything you've done, right? Like these are all the stories I've done. Uh, on the other hand, you want to see how the stories are talking to each other. Um, and so the way in which I navigated, I can definitely say like the way in which Best Worst American, I knew when Best Worst American was done was when I, I had a, this weird one-two punch of like a story that veered from the very comic into like the very horrific uh, and then a story that was very, very short that was commissioned for, for NPR. That was the, that's the title story uh, that was just uh, about reconciliation, about sort of people coming together uh, despite pain. And so that's sort of, I realized, oh, I have, I have the two extremes of the thing that I was exploring. Um, you know, sort of navigating this idea of like how many different angles can you have on this one idea? And then I found them. Uh, with the new collection, I kind of cheated, I want to say, and because it's about Chicago, but every story has an app. Every story is about an app. So like, you know, Twitter, obviously, but like, uh, I realized that for a long time, I was sort of obsessed with Redfin and Zillow and just would just continuously scroll. And actually the story that just came out on Shenandoah, that story is sort of the app for that story is Redfin and Zillow. So for that one, I just have like 
these are the apps that I'm hitting on. And then when I'm done with them, I'm done with them. And so I'm like, I think I'm three apps away <laughs> from, from all the stories. Yeah. I don't know how you choose the apps. There's so many. Oh, it's just the apps that I, it's the apps that I'm and again for anybody who's writing, right? It's the apps that I like. I literally don't know what to do with, and not not like I know what to do with them, right? But like that, I I like I'm like like I keep getting eBay reminders for like this one alert that I set up like five years ago and then forgot to turn off, and now it's like a friend. Like I I kind of want to catch up on so like. <laughs> What, you know, like when you when you ask yourself a question, like why can't I turn off this app, right? Or why is it that I will go and check out dark skies or AccuWeather and check that even though I can clearly see that it's snowing or whatever? I don't need to be on AccuWeather to know that it's snowing, right? <laughs> that's a great uh, question. <laughs> yeah, it is. So a that's great the um, so that that's that's how I <laughs> that's how I determine which ones they were there. It's the ones that really mess me up in one way or another. Yeah. Uh, looks like we have two questions left. Do you, Heather and Olivia want to take them? I think we already did Angela's. So Heather, oh, if you okay. want to hit David, yeah. I think that's the last one. You want to do it a little or you want me to? No, go ahead. Okay. Let's see. Sometimes the best American short stories can be found in unexpected places. I can't read this. Like Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine, do you agree? Oh my God, yes, David. Uh, yeah, totally. So I am a huge fan of uh, genre. Uh, and Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine is just one of those flagship genre journals. Uh, I would add things like the Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction by Charles Finley, uh, Asimov's and Analog, which are both extraordinary science fiction journals. Um, Lady Churchill's Rosebud Wristlet. I mean, there's a bunch, there's many, many great journals, but one of the things that I, uh, that I like about the way uh, the literary fiction marketplace has shifted is that we all know how, like you can't have, like you, can, you really can't do American literature these days without really acknowledging the, the primacy of what used to be called the trashy genres and how the uh, how many amazing writers and amazing stories are there, right? And like you look at the Library of America these days and you know, you see like John McDonald or, you know, or I mean, obviously people like Ursula Le Guin, just these great writers who would have been published in, you know, magazines where, you know, there's a rocket ship and somebody in a bikini with like a ray gun, right? But yeah, so totally well, agree. I, I think I, with those are all the questions that we have, um, unless anybody else, but I can, um, uh, I, I, this was wonderful. I mean, I think, yeah, to be able, is there anything that, that you feel like that was not asked of you that you would like to share? Oh, looks like there was one more question, let's see. Oh. If I can ask this, did you see this question? Does your Colombian heritage influence your writing? I can answer that heavily. <laughs> go ahead, go for it. <laughs> go ahead, I just have a little bit. Heavily, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. That is a, that's a great question, right? Uh, the, for people who read Marquez, he has a, a great line on that, right? It's like, how did you come up with magical realism? And I'm going to paraphrase it, but he basically says, you know, like, that's magical realism is in Colombia. That's just realism, right? Just really weird stuff happens and you just sort of have to roll with it. So yeah, my, you know, being Colombian uh, is part and parcel of my writing. It's just, you know, I can't, I can't get away from it. I will never want to get away from it. I, I love Colombia and I'm just really happy that I get to share some bits and pieces of it with people who are non-Colombian and then also uh, I know that for people who maybe are familiar with it, or if they're not familiar, or if they're familiar with it, but not Colombian, or they've been there, or they've, you know, you know, they're in an adjacent country, a lot of the cultural stock and knowledge uh, that is that shows up in the stories in different ways 
uh, it's just nice to have those little bits of like common currency that I think it's, you know, it's always nice when somebody recognizes them. Yeah. So that's a good question. Um, I was just going to say, I, I think we've, we've, we've kind of come up on an hour and, and oh, wow. I, I know it, it went rather quickly. Yeah. So this has been a really great conversation and I wanted to thank Juan and, and I wanted to thank the Chicago Council. Thank you again, Juan, and thank you, uh, Olivia and Katie and Heather um, and everybody who attended tonight. This was really enjoyable and I'm, I'm glad we got a chance to do it. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Thanks, Juan. Right, everybody, take thank care. You. Thank you, Carrie. Good night. Good night.